Welcome to another episode of the Point of No Return podcast, the show where we go behind the scenes to understand the secrets and strategies of the most interesting Canadian technology companies. On this week's show, I had the pleasure of speaking with Fad Ananta, investor at Roach Capital. I've been following Fad for a while and I was happy uh, he accepted my invitation to come on the podcast. Uh, a little bit of background on Fad, uh, he started Roach Capital last year. It's a seed stage fund. I think they raised uh, just over $6 million to invest in the Canadian tech ecosystem. Uh, prior to that, he worked at uh, Snapchat, he worked at Shopify, and he started a few tech companies, which he sold and had a few exits. Uh, so we spoke a lot about not just, I want to say, the tech sector, but also just like worldviews and philosophy, which made this conversation super interesting. Uh, Fad shared a lot about what he's reading, what he's thinking about uh, as an investor now, as a, I want to say newish investor. I think he kind of undersold his, his abilities to invest in some really good companies. We spoke a lot about what drives him, right? The motivation behind the fund, why he started it his views on startups and uh, and backing these unassailable founders, really the, the, the word behind Roach Capital, uh, and uh, talking a little bit about the Canadian versus US ecosystems, kind of differences and what we can do to really progress in the Canadian tech uh, ecosystem. Uh, it was a great conversation. Fad was such a joy to speak with. I really hope that you enjoy the podcast. Fad, real pleasure to have you on, man. Uh, I'm happy that you accepted. I think like we we're talking about before recording, there's a lot of different areas we could talk about, you know, from startups to remote work. I think one place I want to start and pick your brain on is product. Uh, you know, have, you've you've had that role, uh, you know, a few times in your life. What what do you, do you think about what's the difference between a good and a great product? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for inviting me on. Um, great podcast. Uh, took a look at, um, you know, some of the episodes you've done. Um, yeah, uh, really appreciate it. Um, okay, question is like, what do I think about between a great, great product? I think it really depends. Um, I guess we'll just jump right in, right? But, uh, you know, I think it depends. I think, you know, um, products are a culmination of like a lot of skills within the company, right? And I think product management is actually like different than like the product. Product managers like work with a set of people, a set of skill sets to like and the output is the product. Um, I think good products will typically get a job done uh, in a sufficient way, whereas a great product is like magical. And I think that's like a, you know, it's a pretty like cop out reply. But, um, you know, if you look at certain things where it's just like, uh, it's very delightful, um, like I'll, I'll try to give an example, but like it's very delightful and it sort of like works the way that you would expect it to work. So for example, like I think, you know, uh, most of the products that Apple built are, pretty like up there they're pretty up there in like greatness where it's sort of like you kind of expect it to work uh that way intuitively um because you start getting introduced into the ecosystem so whether if it's like small things like you know how you scroll or how you like you know copy and paste stuff or switch between apps um or even like you know transferring between like one iphone to another or connecting airpods so it's like these like really really small things which are typically not like great areas of investment or high areas of return for, for the company as a business, um, Apple makes sure to get those correct as well. And I think that really changes the gap between like, you know, like a 90% really good product and like a 98%, like this is like excellent. Uh, they have their downsides too. Like there's a lot of stuff that kind of sucks on Apple, like iCloud. Um, and then, you know, you look at like good products, I think a lot of them are sort of like, you know, they solve the problem and it's very like, you understand exactly what it does for you. Like, let's look at like, you know, different SaaS products, for example, but it's not, um, you know, it's not beyond that. It doesn't go like the extra kind of distance to make make it like a bit more magical. Um, we can talk about examples, uh, but but that's kind of the general uh, outline. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's like, you know, this kind of this is esoteric thing of how it makes you feel to a large extent, right? So even if like the interface is not always pretty, right? So like I know, you know, the, 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 the canonical example today would be chat GPT. It's like kind of like a hey, simple interface, nothing that that crazy about how it, the design of it, but it, like you said, there's a magical aspect to it, right? Um, I'd be curious to, he to hear you on, you know, um, the role then of a product manager, right? So how, like, you know, that, that good to great kind of like chasm, right? Like how much of it is engineering? How much of it is art? Yeah, maybe one thing I'll kind of add before that, it's like, uh, you know, you brought up chat GPT. Um, I think it's a cool thing to think about like, you know, how products are created, right? So certain products are just like, you know, just basic, I think there's like three types of products. So there's like improvements, things that are just like iterative improvements on something existing. These are really hard to compete against and build unless you have some other like 
you know, better go-to-market approach, uh, better pricing, et cetera, because you're effectively building the same product, maybe nicer design, maybe like one or two features more. Um, that's difficult. Then there's products that are like, uh, I guess you could, this could also be an improvement, but it's like actually kind of reducing friction. So like you take, you know, like let's say three independent products. Let's say there's a product that does like scheduling, like scheduling appointment booking, a product that does like invoices, and a product that does payments. And you combine all of that into one. So that's like now a, a sort of new product. Um, and you're basically reducing a ton of friction for people. And then the last one is like a novel product. And I think uh, as you go up this spectrum, you basically, so like, you know, at one end of the spectrum is like just a, you know, basic feature improvement. In the middle of the spectrum is like products where you, you know, kind of reduce a lot of friction. Uh, and then at this end of the spectrum is like really novel. You basically get more like leniency on like how magical the product experience has to be, right? So like ChatGPT, because it's such a novel product for most consumers, you don't have to have like, you know, uh, a really magical interface or really like unique way to use the product because like the product itself is really unique. Whereas like, you know, on kind of this end of the spectrum, you have to you know, compensate more. But but yeah, sorry, I decided to derail from your question. No, it was good. No, it was good. I think it, the, the summary of it is like the use case itself kind of defines um, that spectrum, right? So if you're building like a simple HR accounting software where then you have to really overemphasize user experience, design, uh, you know, the, the way the product's used because the end output is sort of a commodity, let's say, versus something that's more innovative, new. Uh, like you could think of, let's say, even the first version of the iPhone, which like today it feels kind of clunky, but because the interface was still so new back then in 2007, it felt magical to a certain yeah. extent. Is that a good, is kind of good dichotomy between? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I think that's kind of why, like a lot of people, like I've heard this phrase like floating around a few times, um, where they say, you know, it's actually like easier in many ways to build a really, really difficult product than it is to build something that's like just iterative. Because on like a really, really difficult product, you're kind of like, like the project itself is like marketing, right? Like you look at like the Tesla, uh, or at least the first versions of it, like it itself is, is marketing. And I think that can can go like a you know pretty, pretty long distance. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good kind of like framework to use, right? Really think about products. So you like famously, you obviously left you know your your operator career. You started a few companies, and now you're, you're wearing more of that investor hat. Is something that you had always planned along, or is just because your natural, let's say, interest in the tech ecosystem, having done some angel investing, kind of led you down that path, uh, or is it part of a big uh, master plan? No, there's no plan. <laughs> Um, I would say most of, you know, everything I do, and I'm sure like most people do, is just a little bit of like serendipity and, um, and luck and just, you know, kind of rolling along as, as kind of like life takes you through like different like chapters. Um, you know, for me, like I, was, I, I grew up as a, or I studied in school as a software engineer. Um, I went to computer, school for computer science. And my first few jobs were just like kind of random, like software engineering jobs that work for like the Toronto Transit Commission. Uh, I worked for the city of Toronto, um, you know, nothing like notable, nothing that paid well, uh, nothing that was even like helping me grow as a software engineer. Um, and then, uh, you know, that kind of started, I was like, you know, me, me building a company and then, you know, I had no clue how to build a company. Uh, and that kind of ended up working out. We sold that first company and then that kind of started getting my wheels moving on like entrepreneurship. And it's like, I think the real big magical moment for me was like, look, I can put in input ABC and there's no like confirmation from the world that like, as you put in ABC, anything is going to happen. But at some point there is like a result. And I think that's like a really meaningful connection, like, or for me that, that I was able to draw um, that like for a lot of times you can like continue putting in ABC and it might feel like you're not going anywhere, but actually there is like a result at the end. And I think that was like a, a, a really, really important one. Um, and that kind of like led me into this, like, uh, you know, growing more into that, that career path. Um, but, but yeah, to answer your question, I think like, you know, moving from uh, an operator, like let's say an engineer or a product manager into an investor um, was never really the plan. I started investing as an angel investor here in Toronto, um, mainly because, you know, I started these small companies and um, I just didn't find like any great resources uh to like raise capital i couldn't find like good like ways to connect to the uh, local angel investor community um basically i didn't know how to raise money and 
And I, and I think like a lot of the folks that I talked to here, to me, it seemed a bit like conservative. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd spent a bit of time in the U.S. and it seemed like, you know, it's conservative. I think like, you know, now that I look at it, it's like from the funds point of view, uh, they actually do a great job for their LPs. Uh, and I think they're great funds. Um, but from a founder's point of view, I think sometimes it might feel like, you know, it only fits a certain slice of founder, a certain slice of business. And so, you know, naively, I basically just started angel investing because I was like, oh, like, you know, I like these businesses. I think they're smart people. I'm just going to write a small check here. So I did that a few times. And then that ended up being like, you know, whatever, like 20, 25 times. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, I'm still working at, at Shopify as an operator. And, um, you know, after I left Shopify, I basically started to like think about if I could do something different. And uh, I really didn't want to, this sounds kind of cliche, but I didn't want to like work in tech um, or, or investing, you know, for a while I, I like built a camper van and I was like kind of like drive around the US in, in like a van and just like chill and then like, you know, maybe buy a farm and just like, you know, raise some chickens or something. And then, uh, and then, you know, I started to kind of like drift back into like, okay, so investing thing is pretty cool. Some of the investments that I made have started to work out pretty well. Um, can I go work at a fund? And so then I applied to a bunch of funds. I like talked to a bunch of funds, applied, and it just never like really worked out. Basically, I couldn't get a job at a fund um, for whatever reason. Either you know I didn't have the previous relationship, or they thought I was like kind of overqualified for in a certain direction, and like you know maybe they, they just wanted like an analyst. Uh, and you know I had no background in, in in being an analyst or or even investing professionally. So that basically led me down this path of like, um, look, maybe I can start my own fund and at least like teach myself. The skill set, so I, you know, put up my own capital to raise the fund, and then end up beating other like fund um, or yeah, fund funds and fund managers, and through that ended up kind of raising this uh, small fund uh, for for Roach Capital. Yeah, interesting. I hear you speak about you know you mentioned before this notion of serendipity, but at the same time, you know, like I, like I was talking before, like I follow you on Twitter and know more, like a lot about your life. It feels like you've fallen more into your life's mission today, right? Like. You've, you've mentioned how Roach Capital, you wanted to want it to be like a Hall of Fame fund, right? Do you feel that that's the case that you've now found on like your your ex where you you take your past experience, your knowledge, you take your capital and then apply it in a way that kind of like scales you much more than right now you're kind of like a solo GP, but scales you much more than you would be an operator or doing something else, uh, raising chickens, et cetera? Yeah, um, this is a good question. Uh, like for, for real, that's a, that's a really good question. I, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I think there's like a part of life where it's like, look, I think it's really important to take the skills that you spend developing, right? You go to school, you get your first few jobs and you, you, you like become pretty good at something, right? And that, that something's usually ideally some kind of narrower thing, whether that's like a payments product manager, whether that's like, you know, product consulting, marketing, like whatever it may be, right? And I think the, um, you know, the general advice would be like, you should double down, you should compound, right? Because if you spent your first, you know, 25 years of your life, basically learning and then becoming an expert at like one thing, then you should spend the next 15 years, like extracting value, right? Extracting value and growing. So it's almost like, sounds crazy to like, you know, give that up and not compound during like the best compounding years and go do something else. Do I get more leverage out of being, um, you know, investor, maybe, I, 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 don't, I don't really answer to that question. I, I think it's fun, um, you know, I'm, I'm having fun and I do think, uh, I agree, I think, you know, um, uh, like I said, uh, the goal is to build a Hall of Fame fund and I think you know, there's not a ton of like pre-seed and seed capital here, especially focused on Canadian founders. Um, so I definitely want to, you know, explore that um, and, and try to, you know, yeah, try to build something that's like long lasting. Um, that said, I think, you know, nothing is also forever and uh, whatever I, I, you know, try to commit to do, I want to do it really, really well. And so for me, I was actually very hesitant to even start a fund. Uh, like I said, I, you know, I wanted to explore the idea of like working at a fund or like maybe, you know, playing around a little bit more. Um, but, you know, once I had mentally committed that I, I'm down to go down this path, then it was kind of like, I need to be excellent at it or find out that I suck. Uh, but it was going to be one of those two. It wasn't going to be like, I'll kind of do it halfway and then move on or like I'll be okay with like kind of sucking and not improving. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, you know, you're going all in basically on, on, on yeah, basically I'm all in. And like, if I go all in and I find out like, look, I'm the worst fund manager of all time, then, uh, you know, it's okay. Like, I mean, I'll learn. It's probably not okay, but I'll, I'll learn. 
And that was, that was a bad bet. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully, it, hopefully I can, you know, continue improving and, and, and getting better and, and you know, getting close to that goal. A few, a few different questions bring, brings to mind. One, maybe more um, micro, but you you spend a long time focused on product and then that's the skill set you bring to data founders right when you sit down with the founder you have that mindset do you find that since you're not like you know hands on the wheel as an operator more do you feel like you you lose that distance and i asked this question a little bit selfishly because because i used to be like really into digital marketing and i knew that space cold and now you ask me like go run let's say uh, you know a scm campaign or social media i'd be like do not hire me like i have no idea what i'm doing i feel like it's advanced so much do you feel that same yeah. sense that since you're no longer close to it, you lose a little bit of that skill, or since you're actively using it with your, you know, your founders, your the the, the companies you back, that you're still kind of close to it? I'd be curious to, to to hear you selfishly on this one. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I mean, okay, so like selfishly, I get to explore a bunch of different domains, right? So like, if you know, I would probably never get hired at like a developer platform startup. But now I can like work with people that run developer platform startups and work with their product teams or help them hire like heads of products and figure out their strategy. So that's really cool. Um, and I get to kind of think through that and build a skill set myself. And then meanwhile, obviously, I can provide a little bit of value, uh, you know, if that comes across. Um, I, I don't think like. Yeah, I guess in, in some ways, like, you know, like naturally I would be distanced from it, right? Like I'm, I'm kind of doing, I'm not spending as much time as any of these people on that specific problem or that, you know, set of problems. Um, so naturally yeah, I'd be distanced from it. But I think from the craft, um, you know, I, I actually started looking at more stuff as like kind of product management. And I think product management is like, it's weird um, because it's not really like a real skill, right? Like it's basically like a set of different ways to think about problem solving. And so, um, it, like, it, sure, in many ways, like, I don't day-to-day, -day, like, I'm not a product manager day-to-day, -day, um, but in many ways, like, I think once I think about it more, once I work with a variety of companies with their PM teams, um, then I start to kind of think about, like, the different varieties of, of kind of product management, how this applies to, like, all the different principles, how it applies to, like, different kind of uh, domains and different sizes of businesses and different areas. So, it's a little bit of both, right? Like, I, like you know, I will probably not be the best PM to work at a company um, because if you put me in as a PM, um, I might be too, like, you know, spaced out. Like, I'm, like, thinking about, like, you know, 50 different verticals or, like, like whatever. Um, but I, I think, like, in the role that I'm in right now where I get to, like, work with companies, um, you know, I spend, like, a few hours with them and I can kind of dive in pretty deep. Yeah, I think that like you mentioned the uh, the problem solving piece, but I think there's another piece that uh, you probably correct me on, but there's like an empathy slash leadership angle to, to being a product manager, right? So it's like you have to coerce a bunch of developers and engineers to like kind of like go a certain direction. And I find that's similar to, you know, to, to, to working with a founder, right? Or a board and like being able to like, hey, let's go in a certain direction, right? And like help at least provide a different perspective. Um, yeah. maybe like maybe a more of a left field question, but you mentioned before, you know, we're be, maybe a bit too conservative in Canada. I think it's been kind of like the motto of like, oh, you know, like Canadian companies, we're not, we're not swinging enough for the fences. There are not, not enough startups and you're putting your money where your mouth is with your fund, trying to like provoke more activity at the, at the seed stage. How do you see these big differences between the U S and Canada, right? Because you've spent a lot of time in the U S as well. So like, how, how do you think about the state, the two different ecosystems here? I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, like, like, I don't know the answers. You know, some of this stuff might get me in hot water, but um, I would say you're like, you know, uh, like the assessment is correct that I think it's like way more conservative, um, like from an entrepreneurship perspective. And I wonder if that's like kind of um, because there's like not a lot of capital like easily available that like there's less people starting companies or because there's not a lot of companies being started that are successful, that there's like less capital available over time. I think it's a little bit of A and B. And I think, you know, if you look at the history of like, you know, Silicon Valley, for example, um, you know, there've been these like iconic companies that have been built over and over and over again, like the last few decades. And, um, you know, that starts to like kind of proliferate in the ecosystem. And all those like kind of uh, folks that make a ton of money end up becoming like angel investors and kind of seeding that ecosystem. Then some of those end up becoming like, uh, you know, fund managers and run their own funds and so on and so forth. So sort of this, like, you know, they had this, um, I guess like, uh, 
you know, like the big bang moment where like a bunch of stuff like started like, like being a catalyst and it created this ecosystem that's really rich now. And, uh, you know, I don't, th- I don't think we have that. I think most cities don't have that, right? Like most areas don't have that. Um, and I think that's okay. I think there's a lot of capital available now in Canada from like US funds and so on and so forth. But I think like generally uh, we haven't seen a ton of like great companies in Canada, right? There's like some good notable ones. Uh, there's like very early stage companies, good kind of like late stage companies and obviously like, you know, like some bigger ones like Shopify. Um, but I, I think like the, like the ones that are done are done really well, but there's not a lot of volume. Um, I think that's kind of like where my current thinking is, but um, I don't know. Like my, my guess is as, as, as good as yours. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what are the things that, that catalyze it? I don't, I don't think it's something that's like simple. I don't think it's something that's like, oh, uh, there's just not enough, like, you know, capital or not enough funds or, uh, you know, the people here are like less risk uh, or more risk averse. I don't think it's anything simple. I'm sure it's more like a, you know, something a bit more complex. Maybe it's like, um, you know, maybe it's like like in, in, the, in the schools that we go, like the biggest schools here in, in like GTA area, for example, or uh, like Toronto or U of T and, and uh, Waterloo. And I think like, you know, even those schools don't like promote a ton of entrepreneurship. We look at like something like Stanford or MIT, um, you know, they have like very dedicated, like their own, like, you know, uh, like designing incubator programs, entrepreneurship programs. They have like other leaders uh, at like existing companies come in and kind of like um, you know, inspire kids. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's like one single thing. I think it's like a ton of things that we just don't have like a network for. Um, and most cities don't, right? Most cities don't. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a good answer. Like you said, there's no like it's it's a very subjective conversation. There's no way to like scientifically say it's like how much is it, you know, the culture, the history, the schools. Um, my my thought on this also is just like it feels like you mentioned volume, and I agree with that partially. I think we see a lot of startups, but we don't see a lot of startups kind of move beyond some say, you know, like invisible glass ceiling, right? Which you see a lot in the US. You see a lot of big successes. Feel like I feel like there's a, there's a vibrant startup community, but are not not enough that make it through, let's say, past, let's say, series B, C. You, you name it mm. and i don't know what the reason is i don't know if it's management i don't know if it's funding uh, there's it seems to be some kind of a block sometimes at that level that there's a lot of like startups that don't make it uh, at least on the bright side um like compared to 15 years ago there was like almost nothing at least i could speak to montreal like in terms of an ecosystem 2007 there's almost nothing here as an ecosystem so your point about compounding and decades we're still so new here, right? So is it maybe, I think the biggest reason in my view is just like, it's, it's new. So it's going to take, it's going to take a while. It's not going to be an overnight switch. Yeah. I also think there is one more thing, which, which is a, uh, which is a big factor, which is like, um, hard to solve for, but it's like, because it isn't there, it's not there. You know what I mean? Like, so for example, like, let's say me and you started a company together and we're start like a SaaS business and we can start from anywhere in the world. So we start from Canada because we're Canadians. And, uh, you know, business starts to do well and, you know, we're starting to like grow our team and so on and so forth. At some point we might decide like, hey, we feel pretty lonely here in Canada where there's not a lot of like support. There's not a lot of like other, you know, execs that we go and talk to really easily. There's not a lot of like, um, uh, like friends that are in the same boat, like starting companies at this stage. And so I think a lot of that also happens. And it's kind of why, like, you know, for as much as people say, like, you know, San Francisco has its downsides. A lot of people end up moving to these like hubs. It's not necessarily the the city itself. It's like you know, uh, I think entrepreneurship is such a lonely journey, and if you end up doing it, you're going to end up doing it yourself, right? Like you may be a co-founder, um, but it's kind of nice to have like other people kind of on like parallel journeys with you, and at least be able to kind of like be in an ecosystem where you're not the outlier. You're sort of um, you're able to kind of talk on like equal footing. Right. Like I remember, like, you know, growing up here, you know, when I started my first company, I felt like a failure because, uh, you know, I'm telling people like I go to these parties with my friends and uh, they're working their like first few jobs. And, you know, some of them are getting like, you know, nice promotions and, and nice salaries. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm working on this Chrome extension. And so, it's, you know, I feel like really out of place. Right. And it's like kind of embarrassing. And, um, you know, like, oh, yeah, cool. It's a nice little like project. Over time, that ends up working out. But, like, you know, in that same vein, like, if I was in, San Francisco, that's probably like a pretty normal thing to say. And I probably don't feel like embarrassed or outlier. And I think a lot of times people just, um, you know, like pe- people do stuff out of like social pressure, right? So even 
kind of like feeling like, hey, this is like not social norm to like start a startup. It's probably why you would go work at a job because that's the that's the social norm. Yeah, yeah having role models, right? So like being able to look up to people, right? And you mentioned support network, right? So it's like a, a support network, like almost therapy, right? Like group therapy for entrepreneurs, like, hey, like this thing is hard, right? Uh, I think then going back to Rich Capital for a second where... I think I imagine part of what you do is providing advice and like, you know, my, my philosophy and advice is that there is no good advice in the sense of like, it, it always depends. Like the answer is always context dependent. There's no like, here's the five things to do, right? Like the classic typical advice, maybe then to pick your thoughts on, I mean, you might completely disagree, which is fair, but how do you think then about advice, right? Because you've lived through it a few times. So you've seen it. So I imagine that you see that there's no recipe nor formula, right? So like when, when you, when you have that conversation with the founders you're working with, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, so I'm, you know, less experienced in this than, than most of these other like kind of big, big VCs and, and firms and stuff. And so I try to be pretty candid. Um, you know, for most of the founders that I work with, I'm basically like a like you know a dude, like a dude that ended up working at Shopify and like now like invest in them. And, and so I'm, I'm a friend. And so you know, usually when they're looking for advice, it's like either something like strategic on the product or something operational uh, or like. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess it's like one of those two things, right? And I think for most of them, it's not like I, I you know, I'll usually tell them and just like, you know, I don't have an answer, um, but we can, let's talk through it together. Like, let's think about the problem, what we can work through together. And I think a lot of times that's basically what people are looking for, right? It's not like advice. And, um, you know, cause like everybody's like journey is like different, right? Like, you know, no one's building the exact same thing and running into the exact same problem at the exact same time. Uh, they're all kind of like different problems. So all you can learn from is like history and other people's experiences. And so, you know, a lot of what I'll say is like, you know, probably two things on the like giving advice. One is like, you know, I, like we just kind of talk through a problem together as friends. And that usually opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, and like we kind of talk to like, you know, if we do A, what is like the pros, cons, B, C, C D, et cetera, right? And then I think on the other side of it, um, some is just like sharing experiences. So it's like, oh, like, I see this problem you have. By the way, I had this problem, like, when I worked at Snapchat, and this is what we saw. Or, you know, I've seen this, like, growth thing at Shopify, and then this is what we ended up doing. Not saying that's the right thing to do, but just, like, you know, here are some data points of, like, how I've personally seen it. And so I think that tends to help people. But over time, like, most decisions that are made are just, like, um, you know, good, good bets. It's like, you know, you know as much information as you can get within a limited amount of time. And then, uh, you know, you hopefully make a, a good bet on it, but you'll never be like a hundred percent informed, hundred percent correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's like one of the, you know, the velocity of decision-making, right? So you want to have 70% infor complete information versus like 90. So you want to be able to go fast, particularly when you're an early stage company, you're burning money and like there's, you know, the wall that's coming. So you have to, you have to move fast. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it made me think of like your, your calendar. When you look at your calendar, what's the the part of the day that, you know, energizes you the most, the, you know, since you've made that transition, like what's the best part of the job for you? The two, three things that, that get you going. Yeah. Uh, interesting question. Um, I would say for me, a lot of it's like personal, right? So like a few days a week, uh, usually like Monday and Fridays, I don't do meetings. Right. And I think those are like really useful for me. Um, because I basically take the time to like think through whether like, like I, I just spend a lot of time reading and so I'm like either thinking through like existing companies and then maybe like I'll send a few emails uh, and like kind of like, like set up some, some conversations. Um, maybe I'm like trying to research a very particular area for someone I'm working with. Um, you know, maybe I'm like, uh, um, but, but, but like, yeah, basically I spend those like two days, like kind of deep in thought. And I think that's like really useful and it kind of like goes down this train and I sometimes I end up tweeting this stuff. And, um, you know, sometimes like, it's a weird gap. It's a weird, uh, bridge between like personal and professional. So like, it's like, it could start with like, you know, something software or business related, but it ends up becoming like this, like kind of philosophical question on like life. And I tweeted and the people be like, oh, dude, like, what are you smoking today or whatever? And, like, I've seen, and it's like, it's funny, but I think it's like, you know, um, I think it's important to, uh, like let your mind just kind of wander. And, uh, for most of my life, like, like probably most people, we're busy, right? We have like busy calendars. Like when I, I know when I worked at Shopify, like it was hard to find time on my calendar to even like, and then you end up realizing like a lot of this stuff is like, you're not, at, you're just kind of like going through the motions. You're not actually like thinking and like, you know, kind of like level setting for, for the, where the world is at or like calibrating to the industry. 
And I think, um, you know, if you have the luxury of like taking like some, some time to like think, it, you know, I think it is a luxury today, but if you, if you take some time to think, um, that really helps you kind of reframe like the problems that you're going through. Cause a lot of times, like, you know, the, uh, you know, coming back to the advice thing too, a lot of times, like the problems that I've seen are problems of like not having enough time to think about it. And if you just take a bit of time to like step back and like, just consider the situation, uh, oftentimes like it's, it's not a real problem where the answer is like very obvious. Yeah. It makes me like the, you know, like the, uh, the, the famous, you know, like uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger kind of schedule where they're just reading all day, right? Like just preparing yeah. for when to make a call makes me think a little bit of that. It also makes me think of like, you know, that, that the famous Paul Graham and say of manager versus maker where it's like, yeah. I think the the maker schedule is like you just think or build, and I think in this case, being an investor is like you said, calibrating or changing your 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 viewpoint of the world, right? Mm-hmm. Like no yeah. one is starting oil and gas companies today. It's all about what's the future of X, Y, Z industry, right? So for that, you have to just read and, and be aware. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, and I think it like like it's a it's a lot of like different thinking, right? It's not like an open end. Yeah, sorry, it's not like like you know I want to think about like. Um, you know, developer platform startups today or something, but it's like kind of open-ended. Sometimes it's a reflection on like myself, right? Uh, like how I'm performing, um, you know, what I could do better, um, you know, how I'm like talking to people. And, and so I think like that just really helps you kind of calibrate and perform better, uh, you know, when, when you're actually interacting with people. Or companies. Outside of specific companies, what are you most interested about, you know, in your reading today, like be it trends or just general things in life that you're, you're passionate about that you're excited for, let's say for the next year? Um, I mean, it's like, you know, work-wise, like, uh, company business-wise, I think a lot of the stuff I've been thinking a lot about, you know, particularly industry is like developer infrastructure. I, I know I brought it up like twice already in like two examples, but yeah, so like developer infrastructure, uh, has been like top of mind, I think mainly because of like, you know, this notion that, so for a while we had, you know, um, uh, like, you know, everyone rolls their own servers and does all the stuff themselves. Then we had like the world of like AWS where everything's kind of like, services that you can use right and then we've gone into like this this era where everything was like no code and so now we're kind of in this like weird era where like everyone is able to build stuff because like we're not really differentiated between no code or code right the shopify is technically a no code product squarespace is no code right these are all no code tools um and so now we're kind of getting to this place where like hey a lot of like the the uh people that know how to code can actually have more leverage like they don't need to be like redoing the same stuff over and over again or monitoring the same things over and over again. Um, and so there's a lot of like, like I guess like uh, technical tools that are provided to people that are like almost assistance to them. And they don't need to be doing like kind of the, uh, like the rote mechanical work that, that they have been doing. So like, let's say that's like production engineering stuff or like ways to like deploy or ways to do like you know, version control, whatever it may be. And so I've been thinking a lot about that. It's like, you know, how do you, if the thesis in the end is like, hey, everyone in the world knows how to like proficiently build stuff on, on the internet or on the computer, um, then there's like two ways to do it, right? You either like, you have to increase the bar for like how you educate people uh, so they can learn and then reduce the bar for like how hard it is to like do that. Um, and so, you know, one is like, yes, you teach people like how to like use a computer, how to program all this stuff, how to code. But then the other bar is like coding also has to get easier and easier and easier. Uh, so that's kind of what I've been thinking a lot about on like the, the, the business side. The other side, like kind of personal or more philosophical, I would say I spend a lot of time thinking about like philosophical stuff. Um, it's weird stuff, man. Like uh, I think about like um, people that talk really fast. Like for example, this morning I was, talking, I was thinking about like, you know, I wonder if people talk fast. Like, is it like a personality? Is it like they're trying to like convince themselves that they know more than they do? Um, like, for example, I have this bias where, like, if someone talks really fast, I almost don't believe what they're saying um, because I don't know. I, you know, so I've been thinking about that. Like, I wouldn't say that's like philosophy. I'd say that's just like funny. And, it, you know, nothing, nothing happened. Like, I didn't like I guess over the course of the last few weeks, I, I met a few people that are like kind of fast talkers. Um, so, you know, thinking about that. And then I think the bigger theme is like. Uh, I think as a as a kind of like culture, like in this tiny slice, like tech people building stuff, um, we we try to do a lot, right? We try to do a lot, and I think a lot of like I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday, and you know she's trying to do like 
four or five things. And uh, to her, it's like, this is the norm. Like, this is what I should be doing. And this is how to like, execute. This is how to stay on par and this is how to be successful. And I'm like, you know, I think most of the people I've heard that became really successful just do one thing really, really well. And, um, you know, so I've been thinking a lot about that. It's like, why do people feel this necessity to be like, I guess, like have a check mark on like, hey, like, I know how to do these five things instead of focusing on like, look, I don't know how to do these four things, but this one thing, I'm like top 10% of the world. Um, so I've just been kind of thinking about those things. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to this notion of like having time to self-reflect because if you're feeling your calendar and it's like Tetris, well, then you're not thinking about yourself and like kind of like how, what makes you different. I just wanted to go back one second to mention, you mentioned the trend of developer infrastructure, right? Like obviously, you know, like things like GitHub Copilot, things are like kind of crazy in terms of like already how many lines of code, you know, like software itself is writing uh, or algorithms, I should say. And then obviously you, you're famously invested in Replit, right? Which is like building kind of the, you know, wanting to bring the next billion coders on, right? So it's like, I think it's definitely an interesting trend. And to your point of tying it into philosophy to a certain extent, you're like, well, if you just draw the through line of where these things are going, like the tools themselves are going to be very easy, right? So it's the notion of what's a commodity and what's really different about people makes me think that the thing that makes people different is their ability to be creative, right? So it's like, that's something I think about. I don't have a very good answer to like, okay, where's the world going to be in you know, 20, 30 years? But definitely it's like, you can see the job of, you know, coding is going to be very different, right? So it's like what people will be doing. I don't know if everyone's going to be a YouTube influencer, <laughs> but you're going to see like for sure it's going to be something different in terms of like what, what people are good at and the skill sets that are going to be important, I think, are about to change. That's kind of like my, my fundamental assumption. Now the how, I think it's going to be a myriad of different ways. That's the, like the, the, the important skill sets for the future. Yeah, I think we go through like periods, um, you know, in the world where like, you know, if I, if I read the history, it's like we go through periods where everyone has optimized for a certain skill set and uh, these are like high value skills. And then you have like a thing that's like, uh, it happens over, or, you know, sustained period of years. And then that basis, I was like, Hey, those skills are no longer that useful. So you look at like um, the industrial revolution, right? So like all of a sudden, all this, like these, like, you know, very intense, like labor jobs are no longer like as useful. Like they have like more leverage or there's like more like machinery and like over the, the period of the next like 20, 30 years, um, and, and like, you know, it's the same fear. A lot of people are like, oh, we're going to lose our jobs. Uh, what will we do? And I think it's like, it's true. The reality is it's true. Like, you know, same thing that um, I think you know, maybe this happened like five years ago or something, but like Andreessen started posting about like uh, the AI revolution or like one of these like software is the world revolution type thing. And uh, and a lot of people are like, oh, like, but the, what's going to happen to like the average person? They're not going to have a job, blah, blah. And it's like, it's true. But also like, if you look on the, um, like the time horizon of like humanity, the, the time horizon of humanity is like pretty short. And I think on that time horizon, we have to go through these like kind of cycles uh, and then you get there and then it's like, okay, like now we have to kind of like recalibrate as like, like, you know, species to say, okay, like what is the thing that we do better than anything else? And I think like ultimately you start to see this theme. The thing that we do better is like go in, mechanically do something and then find a way to automate it and then reset back to like, what's next? And then go and the same thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It's funny you bring up history. It's kind of like one area I like to study just to understand patterns, you know, being able to provide a toolkit. And uh, you mentioned digital revolution, revolution and one of the pet, you know pet theories I have is that we're going to kind of revert back to a simpler form of existence in the sense of like, I think big cities are going to be as important in the future just because you'll have everything you'll need in a much more abundant form, right? Being electricity, be it intelligence, be it anything in, in that makes, let's say, a, a community thrive. We'll be able to do it yeah. at a smaller scale versus, you know, like, putting millions of people together in a one single place that worked for a certain period of time. But uh, that's the fun part is that this, this is not a, a future to, that, you know, that exists today. So it's going to be up for people to do it. So hopefully we get out of our way. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that actually? Like that's a, that's a very interesting thought. Like, um, um, for me, it's like, it's a broad trend of like the world of globalization slowly going away. That's my theory. Uh, and a lot of it's because the U S is kind of recentering back onto itself. So for 70 years, we had this like period of peace and prosperity because, you know, like the U S Navy had all the guns and said, global shipping is going to be safe for everyone basically around the planet. Uh, and that now the U S is like, well, we're not, there's no longer an existential threat. 
right, with the Soviet Empire. So we're like, there's no reason to put bases around the world. So for the past 25 years, the U.S. has been slowly taking away military bases around the world. And so what that means is that we don't we're no longer have a like a unipolar world where it's like one power. It's going to be multipolar, right? It's going to be you know like China. It's going to be India, the U.S., Canada, etc. So if you if you play this out, like my theory is, well, you're going to have a lot less like uh, f- uh, trade, but there will be less of a need for trade if we work on the right things, right? So nuclear energy, right? So having like abundant free energy everywhere, uh, but also the ability to create products locally, right? So think 3D printing, think of everything else when it comes to software, being able to empower your daily life. You won't need to have like, people z- zipping around the world with cargo planes at the rate that we had. So again, mm-hmm. it's very fuzzy, uh, you know, in, in terms of a theory, but that's kind of b- broad trends that I see happening over the next few decades. And if anything, yeah. it's going to capitalize on the world of software, right? So being able to do this at scale for free, right? It's kind of like software. It's, it's incredible business because it's like you essentially create it and replicate it for free. It's kind of how I see the, the fundamental layer behind it. Yeah, that's cool. I like that thought. Yeah, we'll see. Like I don't know. Like you said, maybe I smoke. I smoke too much pot too. That's what. <laughs> it's my, my my idea. Sometimes you gotta be on these outlier like thoughts. Anyway, I want to go back to Roachman because I, we even talk about your thesis. Uh, so like, and like in the few minutes that are left, right? So just like generally your your thesis, the types of companies you're investing in, geography, maybe industry. I'd like to hear a little bit unpack it too. Yeah. So most of it's like very um, kind of general. Right, like uh, there isn't a very specific like sector. There's like a few things that I tend to look at. So like the, the main thesis for the fund is that we invest in people that are roaches, um, the people that are building like internet businesses, and then people that are roaches. And kind of the theory behind that is like, um, you know, roach is basically like the idea behind a roach is like, uh, you know, it's very hard to kill. People that are very like, um, you know, like like can persevere through even like the roughest conditions. Um, I think the idea behind that is like, look, companies. Uh, for any period of, if they sustain for any period of time, so if they don't sustain for any period of time, it's probably not going to you know, go anywhere. If they sustain for any period of time, it's going to go through like uh, massive amounts of adversity, right? You look at like any public company, uh, even at that scale, like it goes to adversity. And like, even they die, right? Like you look at like Blackberry or something, like they die. And so, um, so you know, you ultimately want people that are really, really good at like staying level-headed in like uh, you know very adverse conditions, and then obviously being able to survive, and I think that's like a skill set that's like uh, you know sort of obvious. Um, when a lot of funds say like, hey, we look at like founder fit or like you know or the, like the team or something, uh, I think they tend to lean on like is the team skilled? Like, hey, do they have like a you know good degree? Do they have like good pedigree? Whatever. I think like sometimes by talking to people, we can really tell like what life or business circumstances they've been through that basically show like grit. Uh, that like, you know, um, they might change their mind. Like they might pick a thesis, work on a startup and go like, hey, like, look, this is not working uh, because the thesis sucked. And I think that's okay. But the inverse of it is like, um, you know, a lot of people give up just when things get hard. And I think that's really when businesses are built. Like you have to kind of, you know, the, the, the things that get hard are like the filters, right? So you kind of have to like go through these filters because that's going to catch everyone else. And the more you go through these filters, like the less competition you'll have at that next level. But you go, these filters are like infinite. Like you look at like comp, like every tech company today is going through a filter. Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great point, right? Because you said like to build anything of value, it it's hard. Like you're not you're not you're not going to build something that's easy, right? Like otherwise it'd be already it would already exist, right? So it's kind of like this uh, you know dec- like this dichotomy of like if for you to actually have some kind of success, you have to go through the difficulty. And to your point of like oh like uh, f- you know founder market fit or product market fit, or it's like it's kind of especially at the early stage, it's kind of irrelevant uh, if the founder is not adaptable, right? Or the founding team is not adaptable, right? So going back to this notion of being a, being a cockroach of you just have to adapt, right? So if you choose market A, how many examples, right? Even like, you know, like PayPal famously, it's like, we're going to do like online payments via Palm Pilots, right? Or it's like, there was no market for this. And then the, 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 you know, they pivoted to email, right? And then it being a major success, but it took a lot of hard work to be able to figure out like, uh, abandon something they invested millions of dollars and effort into into something else, right? So it's like I think that's a very good kind of like general. Maybe we did find one good piece of startup advice, right? Having this like kind of roach mentality, <laughs> so it's not a bad one. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think I think that's like uh, you know one of the kind of the primary ones, and then like the other ones we look at are, are you know sort of the the ones that are known. It's like uh, well, there's a, a three tactics I typically use uh, or three points I typically look at. 
And uh, that's basically like, what are you looking to build? Uh, are you able to build it? Like you have the capability to build it with the team or yourself, skill set, et cetera. And then will it matter? Like if you execute on like, cool, really, really cool idea for the future, you definitely can build it. Will people care? And I think if those three things tend to hit, uh, I'm investing like pre-seed and seed stage companies. Um, that combined with like, you know, this roach mindset, I think pretty great odds, right? Um, you know, there's never like, guaranteed success, but I think that's like better odds than, than not. Yeah. Yeah. Fad, this is great, Fad. Super good conversation. I don't want to keep you more. I'd probably pick your bait for another hour or so, but yeah, I think very, very good uh, advice and, uh, and, and feedback. Final question for you, man. Uh, if people want to reach out, connect with you, learn more about Roach, uh, what's the best way? Yeah. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, it's just at Fad uh, or you can look at the Roach website where my email is there. It's uh, roachcap.com. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Tefan. Yeah, thank you. As always, thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe. If you want to learn more, check out thepnr.com.